triumphed over principalities and powers on the cross and he made a show of them openly. And the expression there in the Greek refers to a general who has conquered his enemies and leads them back to Rome uh, in chains to display them and to humiliate them publicly in a great parade through an arch of triumph in Rome to show that his victory is complete over his enemies so that his prisoners, his, the defeated ones, are in chains. And this is the word that is used, triumbuo in the Greek, means just that, that he has made this, uh, this victory and he's had this victory march with his enemies in chains behind him. That's what Jesus has done to the principalities and powers through the cross. That's uh, Colossians 2, 15. And, and to, if you consult any Greek reference sources, they'd probably bring that out for you about that verse. So the point here is that the New Testament repeatedly speaks of Satan and the demons as being bound. Yet we know they do things. They're not totally inactive. Therefore, we have to realize that when it speaks of them being bound, it is speaking relatively. It's not speaking of, in absolute terms. It is with respect to certain of their activities they have been hindered in, but not in every respect. So also here, when it says God will punish the host of the high ones on high, the demonic powers in the heavenly places, it says they shall be gathered together, Isaiah 24, 22, as prisoners are gathered into the pit reminds me of, of, of Revelation 20. Satan is thrown into the pit with chains on him and shall be shut up in the prison and after many days, or as Revelation 20 calls it, a thousand years, they shall be visited. Now, I don't believe that many days or a thousand years is necessarily intended to be taken as a literal uh, description of the time. Simply, it's uh, a long, long time that they will be visited. And so Revelation 20 tells us of the release of Satan uh, for a little season at the end of the age to deceive the world. I take this to be a reference to the period where great deception comes upon the world through the man of sin um, deceiving them. Now, it says in verse 23, Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Now, when is then? This verse starts with the word then. Does it mean during the time that these high ones are imprisoned? Or does it mean after many days when they have been visited, then? Now, it could refer to either period. And, um, and it would, of course, be interpreted differently depending on which it's talking about. If it means then, after a little time, they should be visited, then it would speak of the eternal state. Verse 23 would be talking about the new heavens and the new earth. There's no more sun or moon or stars there in the new heaven and the new earth. Therefore, it would agree with this. The moon should be confounded. The sun would be ashamed. Uh, that is to say, darkened, uh, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. This could be literally the case in the new heavens and the new earth because there will be no sun or moon or stars there. On the other hand, if it's talking about the church age during which the, the demonic powers are, in, are chained, are, are bound in the sense that is spoken of here, then what is meant by the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed? To say they're confounded and ashamed would speak of them being embarrassed. And the figurative language would be here. Here, these, the sun and the moon, were the great light bearers that God established in the fourth day of creation to carry the light to the world. But now, there's a far brighter light that's being brought to the world, one that dims them by comparison. They're, they're embarrassed by their own dimness in comparison to this greater light of the world. As Jesus said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, it is the moon and the stars and the, and the sun were the light of the world that God created in the creation. And these were the natural lights. But when Jesus came and commissioned his disciples to bring the light of the gospel, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, as it says in Second Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, then, uh, or Second Corinthians 4.6, then, then uh, that light is so much brighter. So, and, and when you th think about this, too, remember... What Romans says about the, the things that God has created de declare his knowledge. And, you know, he even quotes from uh, Psalm 19 that says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth forth knowledge. That is, the heavens, the heavenly bodies give the knowledge of God to some degree. So that Paul says in Romans 1, they are without excuse. People, people can't claim they have no knowledge of God because the things God has made, even the heavenly bodies, declare some knowledge of his although limited but the knowledge of God and the light that is brought by the gospel is far brighter than any 
theological insights that the moon and the sun and the stars give to people simply by, you know, those things declare there is a God, but how much more light we get from the gospel than we get from those natural things. So you can understand this either as a picture of the new heavens and new earth after the end of the age, after the many days that the prisoners are visited, uh, which would correspond to the end of Revelation chapter 20, and of course the moon and the, and the new heavens and new earth that were being Revelation 21, or else you could see it as a picture of the church age during which uh, these demonic powers have come under the authority of Christ, have come under the, the foot of the church, and uh, by the way, we'll see more of that in the next chapter, no, in chapter 26, the, the authority of the church over the powers of darkness, but it would apply spiritually now and it also applies literally later when Jesus comes back in my understanding of the situation okay now chapter 25 then says O Lord thou art my God I will exalt thee I will praise thy name for thou hast done wonderful things thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth for thou hast made of a city and heap of a defense city a ruin a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. This would apparently be a reference to Babylon, although the city in the previous chapter was almost certainly Jerusalem, and I think almost all would agree with that. But the reason I say that this may be a picture of Babylon is because it is said of Babylon also in chapter 13 of Isaiah, uh, verses 19 and 20, I think it is, says that it will never be rebuilt. On the other hand, it had said in chapter 24, verse 20, about Jerusalem, it shall fall and not rise again also. So it may simply be saying that the city of Jerusalem after 70 AD will have no more future. It will not be built, meaning God will not ever build it. Men may build it, but it will never, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it. Um, Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. And thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy, in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place. Even the heat with the shadow of the cloud, the branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. So basically it's saying wicked men will be judged. God has protected his people like, um, like a cloud from the heat of the day shelters people. Uh, so God has been to us. Now it says in verse 6, and this is interesting, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. Now, if we saw the previous chapter as being a description of the emptying of the, of the promised land of Jews by, by the judgment of God in 70 AD through the Roman invasion, then this is a very interesting thing because it now talks about the Lord making a feast unto all people. Now think of this, this chronological order. We've seen a picture, perhaps, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, in chapter 24 of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Then almost immediately in the next chapter we see God now making a feast for all people to be a part of. Let me turn your attention over to Matthew chapter 20, uh, what, 22? Yeah, Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> In verse 2, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And the main thing has to do with the dinner he prepared. It says, in, He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding that they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them that are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. And all things are made ready. Come to the marriage. And they made light of it. And they went their way. One to his farm, another to his merchandise. The remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. This is 70 AD. And saith to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as all, as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Now here we see a picture of a wedding feast. And the king is making a marriage for his son, which is, of course, God uh, sending his son to, the, to Israel and inviting them to come into his kingdom. And basically, Jesus is saying, the Jews made light of it. The Jews didn't take him seriously. 
They made every kind of excuse they could think of to avoid coming into the kingdom of God. And they did not take him seriously. And when the messengers came to him, they treated the messengers badly. So what did the king do? He sent his armies and judged them by burning up their city. That's what God did to Jerusalem in 70 AD. Then what did he do? He spoke to his servants and said, Go into the highways and byways. That is outside of the city, outside of Israel, out to the Gentile territories, and bid anyone who wants to to come into the feast. In other words, he sees an invitation being extended to the Jews to come into the kingdom as being invited to a wedding feast. They refuse it. Judgment comes upon them in the burning of their city. And then the servants are commissioned to go into all the rest of the world to bring in people into the feast. Now in Isaiah 24, we have the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, corresponding to the king sending his armies to burn up their city. Then what do we have? Isaiah 25, 6, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast. That is, all people. The Jews didn't come in, most of them. So all other people, anyone who wants to, can now come in. There's another New Testament parable, very similar to the one we just read, which corresponds to this thought in Isaiah. It's in Luke 14. The Luke, Luke 14, in verse 12, is where it begins. It says, Then said he also unto him that bade him, that is, a person who invited Jesus to eat at his feast, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen. Uh, actually, I want, to, I want to go further down. Let's see here. Uh, I want to start at verse 16. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. All these excuses for not coming into the kingdom of God. So the servants came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So again, a very similar parable. This time it's not, uh, the details are not all the same, but it's similar. There's, there's a wedding feast or a, a big supper is made. The first people invited refused to come. They took other things more, as more important than the kingdom of God. Therefore, he went out and invited the maimed, the poor, uh, the blind, and all the wretched ones, the Gentiles, they were all compelled to come in because the original people invited the Jews, for the most part, did not respond. And so here in Isaiah, we see the same progression. Judgment on Jerusalem in chapter 24, in 70 AD, and then the statement that, for the most part now, the invitation is equally to everyone uh, to come into the feast. So chapter 25, 6, in this mountain, meaning in the church. And I, the reason we say that is because there's mention of it earlier in, in Isaiah chapter 2, the mountain of the house of the Lord. The New Testament writers had no question in their mind what the house of the Lord was. You simply have to look up every reference in a concordance in the New Testament as to what the house of the Lord is. There's, everyone agrees, all the apostles agree, it's the church. The mountain of the house of the Lord. What's a mountain? In scripture, a mountain frequently is a, is a symbol for a, a kingdom or a government. This is not just something off the top of my head. You can see this with some consistency. When the word mountain is being used in the scripture in a non-literal way, it is almost always as a symbol of a kingdom. And so the mountain of the house of the Lord is the kingdom of God uh, uh, on which the church is built. The church is, is basically part of the kingdom of God. And when it says in this mountain, that is the mountain that is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 2, the kingdom of God, the church, God has prepared a feast. There's a tremendous wedding feast that we have come to. And it's a feast for all people. A feast of fat things, meaning good things. A feast of wines on the lees. Of fat things full of marrow. Of wines on the lees well refined. These, in other words, it's, it's a feast of really good stuff, good food. And he will destroy in this mountain, now here again agrees, in this mountain, the kingdom of God, the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. This is probably a picture of mourning for the dead. People would put a veil over their face to mourn for the dead. And we know for sure that 
death is in mind when we consider the next verse, he will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of this people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. Now, it talks about him swallowing up death in victory. There's a sense in which that has already happened. It says he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. That is the mourning over death. Death is going to have its end. There's two, two senses in which death is destroyed. One is seen in 2 Timothy 1.10, which I'd like you to see or at least make note of. 2 Timothy 1.10. Right. Now we already saw, if you want to be turning there, we already saw or made reference to Hebrews 2.14 that says that Jesus through death destroyed him that had the power of death. So the, he that had the power of death is destroyed at the cross. In 2 Timothy 1.10, it says, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Interestingly, this word abolished death, the word abolished in the Greek is katergeo, which is the same word that is translated destroy in Hebrews 2.14, which I quoted a moment ago, where it says he destroyed him that had the power of death, rendered inactive or reduced to inactivity. Um, he destroyed it or abolished it. These are simply two English words that the King, King James translators have used to describe the same Greek word, katergeo. So, katergeo is the word. He has katergeo him that had the power of death, that is the devil. He has katergeo death itself and brought life and immortality to life. Katergeo means to either destroy or to re reduce to inactivity. Uh, and so, in a sense, Jesus has already done this. At this feast, in this mountain, he will destroy death. But also, ultimately, he will swallow up death in victory in another sense. And that is at the resurrection. And we know that that is true because of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is even probably more significant to this present passage because it quotes it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 quotes the passage in Isaiah we're dealing with. And um, <clears throat> it's talking about the resurrection and the change that takes place in our bodies when the Lord comes back so that we become immortal. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 53, and 54. 15, 53, and 54, he says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory comes from our passage in Isaiah here. He will swallow up death in victory. Isaiah 25, 8. So, when, th when we become immortal at the resurrection, then it will really be come to pass death is swallowed up in victory. In a sense, Jesus has already destroyed death for us because he said that he that believes on him shall, shall not ever experience death. He said that uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If you're alive and you believe in Jesus, you have it from him that you will never die. I'll give you that verse. It's, uh, it's John 11 and verse 26. So if Jesus said we'll never die, that means that death is conquered for us. Death has been swallowed up in victory for us. But when the resurrection takes place and our physical bodies themselves take on their immortal form, then it'll really be so. I mean, it really is in a sense now, but it'll be so in a greater sense then. So this passage in Isaiah where it talks about God destroying in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and death will swall be swallowed up in victory, it's, it can be seen as talking about what Jesus has done through the cross for us now or it can be seen as the resurrection or both because both are aspects of this. Now back to Isaiah. This is a short chapter. 25.8 He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. You might recognize that line because uh, essentially that is quoted uh, almost exactly in the same words in Revelation 7.17 talking about those who are deceased in the Lord and who are with the Lord in heaven. It says he shall wipe away all tears from their eyes in Revelation 7, 17. So this passage has given the New Testament writers a number of quotations uh, to apply to our, to our present uh, experience in Christ. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. 
and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain, the third time we see the term this mountain, in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. Now, God will rest in this mountain. Where does God rest? Look at Isaiah 66, the last chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? Where is God going to rest? For all those things have my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But, here he answers his own question, To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. In other words, where is the place of my rest? I rest with this man. I... I, I rest with the humble in heart, uh, with Christians, in other words. God's rest, his resting place, his home is with us. Uh, we might see that also uh, in Isaiah chapter 57, in verse 15. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God doesn't dwell in houses made with hands. He dwells with humble people. He dwells with his people. And so his resting place, where is the place of my rest? With the man who is humble and of a contrite heart and trembles at my word, he says in Isaiah 66. And that is his rest. His rest is his resting place, his home, which is in his people. And that in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, says Isaiah 25.10, which means in the church, in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God, the Lord has his dwelling place and his rest. Then in verse 10, it says something interesting. And Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, as he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim, and he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. And the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. Now, what is that talking about? It apparently is talking about Moab. There was already uh, a couple chapters given to the destruction of Moab in the section called The Burden of the Nations, but is this talking about Moab literally? Well, regardless of whether we see this as a prophecy about the church age or as some would prefer a prophecy of, the, of, uh, of things after Jesus returns, in either case it can't be literal Moab because Moab was wiped out entirely by the Babylonians and has not existed since. So Moab must be here as in some other places. Uh, Edom is used this way and Assyria is used this way. Basically just representative of, God's, of the enemies of God's people. And here it's talking about tre treading down under the Lord, Moab. Or it's speaking of God's enemies being trodden down, or the, the enemies of God's people being trodden down under the Lord. Now, you'll see later uh, in verse... Well, I don't know if I, have, if I want to go into this. In, in chapter 26, in verses 5 and 6, it says, He will bring down them that dwell on high. Again, I believe the demonic powers. The lofty city he layeth it low, he layeth it low, even to the ground, and bringeth it even to the dust. It sounds like chapter 25, verse 12, where it says, He lay it low and bring down to the ground, even to the dust. But, it says here, The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. That's chapter 26, 6. Now, notice, the end of chapter 25 talks about God treading down Moab, which I take as a representative of just God's enemies the enemies of God's people. The next chapter uses the same language of an undesignated uh, city, which seems to be the them that dwell on high. And if his punishment of the high ones in chapter 24 and verse 21, Isaiah 24, 21 speaks of the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. If that's a reference to demons, as most commentators agree, then chapter 26, verse 5 would seem to be the high ones, the demons. 
It's not about treading down the demonic powers. This, is, of course, is true in the church and nowhere else. But it says, the foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. Now, the interesting thing is that in chapter 25, it is the Lord who treads them down, whereas in chapter 26, it is the feet of the poor and needy who tread it down. Which is correct? Well, both are correct, because our hands are Christ's hands. Our feet are his feet. Therefore, for him to tread Satan underfoot, uh, he'll do it under our feet. That's why Jesus said to his disciples in uh, Luke uh, 10, 19, Behold, I give you power over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And in an even more striking parallel to this passage, in Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, it says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So, Jesus is the one who's to bruise Satan under his feet, according to Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head under his feet. But here he says, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Because the bruising of Satan is Christ's work, but it's our feet that he uses. That is, it is through his people that he accomplishes the destruction of the satanic empire uh, through the preaching of the gospel and through the prayers of the saints, through spiritual warfare. In other words, we are involved in spiritual warfare right now. Uh, it is depicted in these passages as us treading the powers of darkness, the, the high ones on high, where they're being thrown down and crushed under our feet. Now, that's kind of a, a mighty uh, militant picture of the church. And by the way, uh, I might add that in chapter 25, Isaiah 25, 12, it says, The fortress of the high fort of the walls shall he bring down. Uh, the bringing down of fortresses is, of course, something that Paul refers to in his one of his great passages on spiritual warfare in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 talks about the weapons of our warfare being mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds or fortresses and casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Interesting high thing. The high ones uh, are being judged. God has given us weapons to pull down fortresses, to cast down the high things. And so the language of the New Testament seems to pick up some of the language of this passage and indicates that the high ones, the fortresses of Satan, are to be thrown down through our mighty weapons and they will be treading trodden down under our feet and by the way I didn't point this out but in chapter 26 I read verses 5 and 6 about how the feet of the poor and the needy will tread it down but in the earlier verses 3 and 4 it says thou wilt give him perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee um, in that verse I gave you from Romans 16 20 it says the God of peace shall tread Satan under your feet bruise Satan under your feet shortly the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. And Isaiah says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. He is the God of peace. And it says, And the foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. It seems like images from this chapter are borrowed by Paul in uh, more than one place, Romans 16, 20 being one of them, that he seems to apply this passage to the spiritual warfare of the church being conducted at the present time. Well, um, we are moving right along we have a little bit of time yet so let's let's go into chapter 26 in that day shall the song be sung in the land of Judah we have a strong city salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee trust ye in the Lord forever for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength for he bringeth down them that dwell on high, the lofty city. He layeth it low, he layeth it low. Even to the ground he bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Or actually, weigh speaks more, the word is not a good translation, it means to prepare the, the path of the just, like uh, to get the obstacles out, to make it smooth, to grade it. Um, yea in the way of thy judgments O Lord have we waited for thee the desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee with my soul have I desired thee in the night yea with my spirit within me will I seek thee early for when thy judgments are in the earth 
the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. For when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. But they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Now, <coughs> what's this talking about? It says in that day, in verse 1, the land of Judah will be singing, we have a strong city. Now, this is talking about the physical city of Jerusalem. The physical city of Jerusalem has been destroyed in the prophecy earlier. And it, is, and it will rise no more. So what is this city, this strong city? Well, it is not a physical, geographical city. It's, it's a spiritual city, very plainly, because it says the name of the walls is salvation. Uh, salvation is, is what the walls are made out of. In other words, it's, salvation is spiritual stuff. It's not physical stone. It's talking about the, the kingdom of God, the church as the city of God, as it is spoken of in Hebrews 12, uh, which I will read again for you, though I've, uh, I constantly bring it up in Old Testament studies. But in Hebrews 12, verse 22, a discussion of the church, it says, We are come, or we have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. That is Hebrews 12, 22 and 23. The city of the living God is a reference to the church, the general assembly and church of the firstborn. We are a community of believers in the earth, a city of God. Uh, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So the image of a spiritual Jerusalem is, is used of the church frequently in the New Testament. And, um, and that, I think, is borrowed from Old Testament language. Obviously, we've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, spiritual Jerusalem. Uh, this is the church. Well, the city mentioned in Isaiah 26, 1, the strong city having salvation for walls, is the church. And uh, we could further show that from Isaiah 60, where similar language appears. Isaiah chapter 60, where it says in verse 18, Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting no destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. Now again, this hardly refers to a physical city, where the gates are praise and the walls are salvation. Well, it's, it's portraying a, a spiritual picture of the church. As ancient cities had walls for protection, we have the salvation of God surrounding us for protection. As ancient cities were entered by physical portals and gates, so we enter into the kingdom of God. We enter into his courts with praise. The gates are called praise. The walls are called salvation. This is a spiritual picture of the church as the city of God. And he says, Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. There is no righteous nation other than the church. The church is a nation. As Peter said in 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, We are a chosen people, uh, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The church is a holy nation. It's, the church is the only nation that is righteous or holy. Uh, the Jews and the Gentile nations altogether are wicked. And so the only ones who enter into the gates of this city are the church, the righteous nation that keeps the truth. Notice it doesn't say that keeps the law, but keeps the truth, as the truth is in Jesus. Then he says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Now, the person who trusts in the Lord, the Lord will keep him in peace, perfect peace. Actually, in the Hebrew it says peace, peace. Shalom, shalom. Thou will keep him in peace, peace. And so the translators translate it perfect peace. Um, whose mind is stayed on the another. The person's mind is attached to God. He will not allow his sights to be removed from God. He's looking to God wholly. And as the result of his unbroken gaze upon the Lord, the result is that he has peace in his inner man. And certainly that is described for us in the, news, in the scripture. Uh, uh, in fact, it's interesting too. It says, whose mind is stayed on thee, meaning a person is thinking on the things of the Lord all the time, resulting in peace. He's thinking on the things of the Lord, on, on the Lord himself, and that results in peace. Paul might be alluding to this very passage in Philippians chapter 4. If I can find it. Philippians chapter 4, where he says in verses 7 and 8, 
and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts remember thou wilt keep him in perfect peace the language reappears in slightly changed order the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ then what finally brethren whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are honest whatsoever things are just etc think on these things he says so he talks about the peace of God keeping us as we think on these things as we set our minds on the things of God on the holiness and the purity and the characteristics of God now that sounds to me at least like the same concept as you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee um, sounds again like Paul takes this verse and applies it to us today which is to imply of course that it's a church passage in Isaiah it's talking about the church age in which we live and we now have that peace um, one other point to make and I'm going to have to quit here because we've run out of time but let me just make this other observation we'll finish chapter 26 next time in verse 9 in the middle of verse 9 it says for when thy judgments are in the earth the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness but the next verse says let favor be showed to the wicked yet he will not learn righteousness now here's the question of how are the inhabitants of the earth going to learn righteousness it says you can show him favor you can bless him you can do good to him you can prosper him but he won't learn righteousness that way in fact in the land of uprightness you can surround him in an ideal environment yet he'll deal unjustly and not behold the majesty of the Lord now this of course comes against the humanistic idea that man is basically good and it's just his environment that has corrupted him so he says you put him in the land of uprightness you put him in a perfect environment he'll still be wicked because it's in his nature it's not a conditioning he gets from his environment it's something that he brings into his environment and he is the one who's corrupted his own environment you put him in a perfect place like the Garden of Eden and he will bring sin into it and so it is by being nice to him by showing him favor by giving him a, a blessed experience that is not how he's going to learn righteousness but verse 9 says when the judgments of God are in the earth then the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness so righteousness is taught through God judging it's a shame we have to be smitten before we learn lessons but that's the way children are apparently uh, they need to be disciplined and trained to get the foolishness out of them and that's the way people are after they're grown up too God if he blesses us we just interpret it that he's either letting us get away with our sin or that he approves of what we're doing and therefore he's blessing us um, and so sometimes he has to stop blessing and, and start smiting and bring judgments so that we'll learn righteousness um, it's a shame because it says the goodness of God is intended to lead thee to repentance but uh, even though it's intended to do so it doesn't always do so and uh, it is the judgments of God that so often are necessary to bring repentance I don't know if the others are even going to know in our last study in Isaiah we covered chapters 24 and 25 and part of chapter 26 and uh, I was saying that the, the general subject matter of chapters 24 through 27 four chapters that go together seems to be uh, centered around the fall of the Jewish system in 70 AD and the resulting uh, spread of the kingdom of God globally after that in other words I believe these chapters are a description of the transition of the two covenants the outgoing of the first and the incoming of the second or the new covenant and so we find throughout these four chapters 24 through 27 um, references to both events the fall of Jerusalem the judgment that came on the old system with its temple and its sacrifices because of the uh, abuses of it and the inadequacy of it to fulfill God's ultimate purpose and we have also passages that celebrate and predict the things that he does as the result of this or after this in the new covenant now <clears throat> we need to realize uh, that there was in fact a period of transition between the two covenants uh, when Jesus died on the cross there can be no question the new covenant was established and really the sacrificial system and all that of the old covenant was was of no use afterward but there was a good 40 year period there after Jesus died on the cross and before Jerusalem was destroyed that is from the years 30 to 70 AD a 40 year gap <clears throat> one generation as Jesus called it this generation will not pass he said until these things be fulfilled but that generation was sort of a transitional generation not because God was had not made up his mind on the subject of which covenant was in force 
God had made up his mind at the cross and there was no more validity in the old covenant but there was a transition in the mind of the Jewish believers uh, because while they had come into the new covenant they still did not have a clear awareness that this new covenant was something entirely independent of the former covenant and so as we remember from the study of the book of Acts during that 40 year period after Jesus was crucified and the church grew in Jerusalem and until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD there was a church in Jerusalem that was at the same time zealous for the gospel and zealous for the law and the apostle Paul and his companions and those who were like minded with him uh, understood far earlier than the Jerusalem church did that the gospel and the kingdom of God were not associated with the old covenant at all anymore but there were faithful Christian Jews in Jerusalem nonetheless who were confused about this matter and it was not until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD until when everyone was it was made very clear that Christianity was not a part of Judaism because Judaism in its biblical practices of sacrifices and so forth ended in 70 AD there's never been a sacrifice offered by the Jews since that time therefore though there are people who call themselves Jews and they believe that their religion is Judaism yet they don't practice Judaism they can't because the sacrificial system is not in, in force they don't make pilgrimages on the holy days to Jerusalem there's no temple there uh, so Judaism came to an end very clearly in 70 AD in the mind of God it was all over in 30 AD but as I said this transition period <coughs> is something to be uh, figured that in the minds of the godly Jews who are Christian Jews it was not clear until 70 AD that they were part of a movement that was totally independent of anything related to the Old Testament or the Old Covenant well it is this transition and this putting away of the old and the bringing in of the new that is here to discussed in Isaiah chapters 24 through 27 and it is not as though we get some kind of a chronological layout of what's going to be happening sign the clipboard Oh, okay, you had an excuse? You can still sign it and we'll, we'll initial it. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> but we have, as I said...